My guest today is an Emmy and Grammy award-winning keyboardist, singer, composer, arranger, producer, and a member of legendary band Toto, who are releasing their first album in almost 10 years, Toto 14, which is out on March 24th in the U.S. I'd like to welcome David Page. Hey, how are you doing? Good, man. Pleasure to speak with you. How are you doing today? Good, man. How about yourself? Doing all right. Thanks for being here. I guess let's let's begin with the new album. And, uh, you know, you guys coming back to doing a new record after almost 10 years. Uh, yeah. You know, you guys must be excited and, and, and must be ready to get out there and tour. Tell me why you guys uh, got back together to do it again. Well, we're very excited about this. And uh, believe it or not, this album came out of a contractual obligation, which uh, we didn't know was in our contract here. And sometimes when you don't make albums for, you know, five, six, seven, eight years, you don't realize that there's language in contracts. This is part of the rock and roll business. We did the Fib album, and we thought, well, that's going to be our last record here, but we didn't know, uh, and I won't go into that long in a uh, dramatic story, but right. uh, we didn't know that, that, that the record company had an option for one more record here. Uh, so we said, hey, we can either get all up in arms about this, or or we can uh, sit and use this as an opportunity to... Uh, Get, get all get in the room and do what it is we do, which is get creative and, and make music together for our fans. And if there's anything we have left to say here as a band, uh, maybe it was meant to be that uh, we have one more album in us. So uh, it's so, so it's funny how fate works out. It's like it was meant to be. You know, we've been uh, going out on the road here from 2010 doing uh, for Mike Ricaro for ALS awareness and to raise money for him and. And every time we were getting together, everybody's the crew and people around us were saying, well, you guys are playing so good, you should do another album. Right. And we're like, well, maybe not, maybe not. And then we said we found out we needed to, so uh, we scheduled an album here. Uh, <laughs> this funny. was last year. Which was last year, you know, you got to put it down because people are doing all kinds of other things. It goes on the calendar. Uh-oh, we're <laughs> out of nowhere, we're doing another album. So we thought... Well, what are we going to do? Just give hand them a bunch of things that odds and ends that we have, which we we pulled out some things to listen to, and found out there were a couple of old thing, older things uh, that had been in the can that we re polished and cha- refitted the lyrics to. Like Chinatown is is an example of something I'd written back in 1978, but I had my 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 thing on the lyrics was totally politically incorrect, and I had to uh, the storyline was wrong. I had to rewrite the entire thing. But generally, the music was pretty much the same as it was then. So you're getting a little taste of Toto from the first album there. That's the only guy there. And the rest of it, we were in the studio with uh, Luther, myself, uh, and Joe, Joseph Williams, for the most part, uh, sitting to, all playing together and singing together in my studio, writing these things uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the moment, you know what I mean? As well as Steve Carl writing and C.J. Vance, been our producer, writing uh co-writing with uh, our band also so it became a really fun uh, uh you know involved creative process it's, I, I always enjoy the collaborative effort because uh even i get stuck you know on a, something like great expectations i had the first part of it i had the first couple of parts and then uh you know you have steve luca there and you have joseph williams to come in and help uh help guide me uh navigate me through treacherous waters you know very cool, man. Um, after so many years of, of doing this and putting out all these records, uh, in a situation like this, getting together and songwriting, is any part of it different? Is is how you guys record today different? Has it has it changed a lot from what you guys normally did? Well, that's an interesting question because we talk about that. You know, in the old days, in the first album and the fourth album, I mean, we used to just get in the room and I'd say, "Okay, here's the new song," and I start playing it. Jeff Ricard would start playing it. And the guys were so fast that by the end of the song, guys will have learned the song practically. That's how fast these guys are. And we're almost ready to do a take. So we'd be in the studio all of it. There was no demoing of things back in the old days or making blueprints like there is now. And so, like I said, we would just play it and record it, you know, kind of Beatles style here. Here's the song. Let's go record it. And, uh, or we rehearse. Sometimes we 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 rehearse. Uh, we'd run over things in rehearsal uh, when we were just putting the band together. And so guys kind of were familiar a little bit with some of the songs that I've been working on. But this album here was created kind of in the studio here, 
where we make these blueprints like other, but not unlike other people go out there where you start kind of with a click track and you start with a, a drum beat or a drum loop and then people start playing on top of it where most people do one person at a time and you're sitting there and, and putting it together section by section. Toto, when we play to a loop or play to a existing drum group, we're playing from top to bottom. I mean, Joseph has a mic in his hand, Steve has his guitar, and I'm on keyboards. And we're literally, the, the computer or the drum loop or whatever we're listening to is the fourth musician in the room. So we're creating a song, almost jamming in the room in real time as a band. So there still is this live, in-the-moment uh, aspect to our songwriting that uh, you know we're playing, and that's how we end up recording the stuff when we do our blueprints, and then we just keep upgrading our blueprint to where when we go look around, we go, you know what, this record is, uh, it's it's all this particular song's all done except for the drums, and this is one one uh, while well, uh, one record record where we waited to put the drums on uh, last after all the overdubs and singing and everything was done, um, or most of it with Keith Carlock because we flew him in to uh, be the drummer, and what a luxury it is, and kind of a cool thing, to have a drummer hear a fire-finished record, so he's he's not playing and trying to imagine what overdubs are going to be on, which is what we used to do in the old days. Sure. Everybody's got to play, thinking in their head, well, this is good. you got to keep room for vocals, you got to keep room for this, but it's all imaginary, none of it's there. So this one, you can hear all this stuff. And we've done this before, though, you know what I mean, with Simon Phillips and Jeff, there are certain songs where we would make the whole record and the drums were the last thing to go off. So this is nothing new to us or the recording industry about sometimes putting the drums on being the very last element that go on at the very end, you know. I even heard Stevie Wonder did that on a few of his records, early records there, like Living for the City, where he'd play all the keyboards and the drums would be the last thing to put on, <laughs> played by him, you know. So uh, that's, so you can play your drum track listening to the whole finished record, which is a, a, a great uh, uh, key thing to play, to get a good drum track right there. So that is that's cool. one of the big differences, you know, is that we, we, we used a, you know, a loop or something uh, a lot of times started with a drum loop or a, per, or a percussion track and played to that as the fourth member here while we were writing. But the difference is before you had to make, you couldn't use those demos or those drum tracks in these days. Today, everything is so high quality and hi-fi that you can actually keep everything because of the state of digital recording and, and logic, uh, the program that we use and, uh, and pro tools and all these different, uh, great tools that, uh, allow you uh, and sounds uh, allow you to keep a lot of stuff that you uh, end up uh, uh, with the initial blueprint there's a lot of songs on the album that I mean they, they sound ready for radio you know right away like a song like Burn which is you know fantastic right. and then and then, uh -huh. like you were referring to Chinatown which is another track I wanted to bring up because you, it's interesting that you mentioned it's it's from an older demo because it has sort of an old kind of jazzy feel to it a little bit yeah um, you know is this something you guys I, I think most of your albums generally sort of have different kind of styles throughout is this something you guys always try and go for I think that's a, something that's just in our DNA you know, as musicians here, we have these, uh, uh, you know, we all have this R&B thing, this, these roots from having played in high school together, having played Slide Stone and, and, and James Brown music, and then graduated to uh, listening a lot to Earth, Wind & Fire and actually working with uh, Maurice White um, from Earth, Wind & Fire and Verdeen and playing with these people. We've, we've rubbed shoulders with them and played with them and then done, done, done uh, concerts where uh, we've both been on the same bill. So it's kind of in our DNA that we have these in our tool, in our toolboxes, you know what I mean? Yeah. These are in our, in our wheelhouse. And uh, uh, so when it comes down to something like, and, and understand something, in Chinatown, none of the original demo is on this record right here. We totally recut every aspect of Chinatown in there. But we tried to capture this, I was, I, for better or less word, I said this earth, wind, and fire pocket that earth, wind, and fire used to have when it comes to uh, uh, the, the instrumental part and to the vamp out and everything like that, which has always been a, cha a fun challenge to do. And uh, I think Toto does a real, real good job, you know, because we were no strangers to that. I mean, we did, uh, Jeff and myself and uh, David Hungate did the Boss Skaggs Silk Degrees album 
uh, which was very R and B oriented, and uh, so we were all you know immersed in R and B and that kind of jazzy thing. You know what I mean? We uh, yeah. we brought Tom Scott in. It's so fun because Tom Scott's always been involved with this, and we brought him to play the saxophone on Chinatown, and he just added this little steely Dan esque Asia quality to it. He's known for with his great sound of the saxophone. You know, it makes it more organic to me, homegrown, to hear a real instrument instead of playing sampled, uh, sampled this and sampled that. We try and go for real players. You hear Lenny Castro playing on that, all the percussion. Tom Scott's playing a tenor saxophone. Keith Carlock's playing drums, and we're all playing. You know, that's that's how we sound. Yeah, when we get in the room well, listen, jam, it sounds like much. it. Um, sounds like it for sure. The uh, the other track that stands out to me a lot is uh, the opening track, Running Out of Time, which just has a killer opening riff and, and has kind of a real progressive sound to it. Um, yeah. How'd that song kind of come together? Again, that's that's I think that was week two. We, uh, Luke and uh, myself and Joseph Williams were in the studio, and uh, we wanted to do something that was up, that was an- anthem-like uh, and um, powerful, and so we got got a tempo going. And a, and a real powerful hard rock drum groove going. It's not unlike the one that you're hearing on there. Yeah. Uh, and and they started playing that riff. He just he, he broke into the riff, and I was on. I had a Hammond organ right there, and Joseph had a microphone, mm-hmm. and we started writing it right on the spot. Once he did that riff, I went into a B section, transitional section, and we all kind of naturally went into the chorus together. It's funny because we have this shorthand. Uh, of just doing things very quickly because we played so much and Joe start, started singing these words and we were very close to what you finally hear uh, within the first uh, 15 minutes of uh, jamming on that at my house you know what I mean so that's how that came is from us actually being in a room and jamming together and uh, writing uh, uh, writing these little sections and trying to uh, consciously write a song uh, for uh, an opening song for the album. Yeah, you know it's I mean? a perfect, so, perfect opening song, and and Toto fans will dig that one for sure. Um, I'm glad you like. I'm glad you like it as an opening song because we were always thinking of should we put Burn for the opening song or maybe even Great Expectations and be bold here. What do we do? And uh, it came back to a lot of people thought that uh, Running Out of Time was a good opening. You, you know yeah. what? It's just sort of like you you push the track on and that riff starts and it just sort of kind of gets you going. So I think that we're that off. Was... It's like it's like a horse race. It's yeah, like it's exactly they're, like they're off. They're off. Yeah. you know what I mean. Everything, yeah, you know? very cool. The uh, speaking of Joseph uh, uh, Williams uh, um, coming back and singing on on the whole album this time, first time since yeah. I guess the seventh one, which is another okay. one of my favorites for sure. Um, right. how, how was it bringing him back and, and working on, on a full album together this time? It was absolutely awesome. You know, I can't say enough about him. Uh, first of all, when we were touring, he's such a strong singer and has continued to be such a strong singer, but he's singing better than ever now. It's like, because when you go out live and you're touring two hours, two hours a night in a live show, everybody gets stronger singing wise and playing wise and, and confidence wise and everything. And after our fourth year, you know, doing it, we're like, you know, all revved up and, and the muscles are toned. He just came, he just brought it, you know, is all I can say. And, uh, and he had everything we needed to. Every time you sing a melody, what's so fun is to have a singer there. And you go, well, I really, if I could sing high, I'd love to hear the singer sing this. And you sing it to him and he sings it. Or he will or he just comes and sings a melody to you, like on Great Expectations, that that I would never think of because I don't sing up in that uh, range, and uh, it's a wonderful thing. You know what I mean? Yeah, for it's sure. Having 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 a trumpet, having a trump, having a lead trumpet up there, uh, being able to tout, you know, shout above the whole thing, and sound musical and distinct and articulate. You know. Now you still sing on some songs on the album, correct? I do. Uh, I, I sing little pieces, though. You know, I sang the whole song. I sang te- all the tears that shine is me singing pretty much the whole thing. Right. And the, the, the ensemble singers, the Toto Ensemble, uh, singing ensemble, joins me in the chorus. But that's, pro- that's probably my big solo thing right there, is all the tears that shine. Then I have a short opening spot on Great Expectations, and I share the verses on Chinatown with Joseph. So how do you guys decide when you're doing that? Like, For example, going back, way back to like Africa, where you sing the verses... Um, you know, and then I think Bobby Kimball sings, you know, the chorus. How did you guys over time decide who sings what parts and, and that sort of thing? 
Um, well, it comes out of trial and error. We all, first of all, we all try and sing the song as as an indiv- uh, individually. I listened to Lukather sing the song from top to bottom, and this was the same with Africa. Oh, really? Everybody took a stab at everybody took a stab at Africa. Bobby Kimball, I mean Lukather, and uh, uh, you know it was usually when someone else, if, if 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 guys can't sing all the words or they can't spit it out, I end up singing the song. You know, I mean, <laughs> if I wrote as the bottom man of the totem pole. When all else fails, <laughs> I end up singing it. You know what I mean? So. They just couldn't get, I wrote these words, and they just didn't get the word, all the words out in Africa, so I had to sing that one. Otherwise, somebody else would end up singing it. You know? But on these songs here, it happens by, like, on Africa, on, on, I, I want, I listen to Luke there sing it, his voice from top to bottom. We tried to do different scenarios, because we didn't start with this three-penny opera idea of, of round robin and having three different characters, although Toto's known for doing that before, like on uh, Rosanna, and stuff uh, in, in Africa where we've shared vocals. It's certainly not our intent to try and do that, but we found that certain vocals laid good in certain people's registers. Yeah. And uh, it helped with the story because it's kind of a story of, of three guys in Chinatown uh, that uh, is from my early days in Oakland with my cousin where we used to go across the bay and hang out and try and get into trouble in Chinatown with a couple of his friends. So it's kind of a, a an ensemble piece there, but Again, to answer your question, the way you choose who sings what is by having each of us try and sing the song from top to bottom and listening to who fits right into which section, you know. I love to hear and, that. And uh, Joseph sang, sounded great in the high parts of the verse. I was able to lend something, kind of a narrative quality, to the opening verse parts in Chinatown, but when it came down to the real Toto, Georgie Corgi, Earth, Wind, and Fire-esque meat and potatoes, that's Lucifer all the way. I mean, he just owns that uh, kind of singing and uh, interpretation there, you know, hands that's, down. That's very cool. I, I'd love to hear if um, you knew at the time that a song like Africa was going to be a hit or, or when you hear a, a song even from this album, can, can you tell or, or have you ever been able to tell like this is a hit or I thought that would be a hit, but it didn't turn out to be, you know, you know what I mean? Uh, yes, yes, that's happened. I can go back to the first album. I thought that uh, Hold the Line and Georgie Porchy definitely had the potential to be hit records there. Those were some of our choices. Uh, Rosanna was specifically written to be constructed and and, and kind of uh, with a, having a hit record in mind there. So that was no surprise to me because I just put everything I... Every, Thing that I had into that and said, if this isn't a hit, I'm going to hang it up right there. <laughs> but Africa, Africa was different. Africa was like we thought we had our album done, and Africa was kind of like an extra cut. Okay, we're going to. De- I had something new and kind of was like a world music kind of thing, which we know world music wasn't even around. But well, I'm calling it world music right now. Something experimental, and it was kind of like Dave's Dave's cut, and we're going to give Dave an extra cut on this. To do something here, people who the big joke was save it for my solo album because they knew I didn't have a solo album. So it was like, Dave, save that for your solo album. But we ended up getting into it, everybody. And and it's one of the first ones where we didn't play all as a band live like we did on, uh, you know, the rest of the, the rest of the album. We piece we, we we the people hadn't been doing loops at the time. Well, we were one of the first people, probably after the Beatles to do a loop on our record right there. We had Al Schmidt, and there was actually analog, 24-track analog tape going around the room, around microphone stands and stuff, just like you see in the pictures. Mm-hmm. And it started with Jeff Percaro and then Lenny Castro making this percussion loop that you hear in the very beginning. And then we, uh, I put on a CS80, and we probably put on a guide vocal track, and we did, I think, vocals, and then each person, Steve Luke there put his on one at a time, and David Hungate on one at a time, so it was very one one instrument at a time, not unlike Brian Wilson did on Good Vibrations, which was one instrument at a time. So that started back then, but is now it's, it's common practice. That's what people mainly do: is here's this one instrument, here's this instrument, and we did that then, and we did not know it was going to be a hit record because uh, the band after that, uh, they have another, uh, I would get uh, harangued after was if you know you next time you're going to write a hit record make sure you aren't singing lead on it guys will tell me the band <laughs> let the lead <laughs> singer sing the number one record i said i will do that we had no idea there was going to be a hit record you know 
believe so me, you know, and uh, so that's the last one. But occasionally, you know, like on the new record here, uh, when we heard Burn the first time, it's certainly not, we're not writing it thinking, oh, this is going to be a hit record. But after all the elements are on there and it's mixed, and we listen to Burn, it certainly sounded like it had it, it could jump out there. Orphan uh, sounded to me that's probably the closest thing to writing a hit that I've been involved with here, and I hope it is a hit. But uh, that's that's very to me uh, what a hit record sounds like. Orphan to me, if I was to pick one on the record, you know, very cool, something um, like that. I wanted to ask you, and uh, because I've heard, you know, sort of rumors online and stuff about possible tour with Yes, is that something that is happening yet, or, or can you say? Um, I can't talk about that right now because there's nothing solidified right now. Right. There's, uh, I was been, we've been talking about that, and if any, if that comes together, we're trying to put together a U.S. tour now, and they were mentioned, uh, and hopefully we're going to do something with them. But I cannot guarantee, I cannot lock in any details about that as of yet okay, uh, cool. that may happen and that may happen in the next couple of weeks and I will update you if that does happen awesome um, you know I get one more question for you I was I'm wondering um, you know af- being fortunate to be in a time when when records sold and you know you could be a successful musician and, and certainly you've been uh, when you look at the music business today I mean are you glad you're not a band starting out today I mean what how would you look at it if you were I am I am uh and I'm not. There's I have mixed feelings about it. Uh, I think it's so great how the, the the great singing that's going on, and every they sound so many great singers, and the technology allows you to do uh, all these different things. It makes it, there's a certain aspect that makes it easier and more consistent. But yet there's so many people out there now. It's become such a profession where, in my day, it was kind of like joining the circus and running away and kind of not kind of frowned upon to be a rock and roll star and to be a musician and stuff like that. So it wasn't quite as competitive and you could stick out and sound a difference where now everybody wants everybody to sound the same. It's kind of modeled into this cookie cutter thing. You know, when I hear all the, a lot of the songs coming out of, uh, uh, that are called country coming out of Nashville and I hear a lot of radio stuff, uh, there's a lot of sameness to it because it's packaged and produced on computers the same way. And, uh, Again, I, I'm glad that we came up at a time where there was a lot more uh, the bands you played all your own stuff, yeah, and, not, sure. and bands still do that. There's still bands out there playing today, and Dave Grohl with you know Foo Fighters, and uh, there's a lot of great music coming out there today. But I think we had a better chance back then of being more unique and to be able to hear us as being unique because there wasn't such an abundance of people play, locking the time in and, pl- and singing in tune and locking the time in. I mean, if you listen to rock and roll in the 60s and 70s, it was very loose rock and roll. You know, people, and Toto was known for playing very precise, and and almost you could put, put a clock on it. And we were playing how everybody sounds today, which is very tight, very in tune, and kind of polished, you know what I mean? Yep. That's what we were known for, because it just our music just happened to sound sound good that way like queen's music you know we we total can play out of tune and detune and we can play raunchy and and drunk uh sounding just like the stones do but our music just happened to sound better when it was t- in tune and played uh locked in meter wise and time wise there so you know i think it was easier for us then and i'd hate to have to go and try and get a deal now with my band now it's so hard because there's so many great people out there but uh you know we're very lucky to have uh, been around the era we were and been influenced and I'm, uh, again we have our fans to thank and people like yourself that are interested in interviewing us and still spreading the total word out there if it wasn't for our fans and and, and, and the whole collective uh, you know people out there uh, we wouldn't be around so we're very blessed and very lucky very very cool man listen it's it's an honor to speak with you and I'm a big a big fan and I have a lot of friends oh, who are big thanks, fans man. and uh, listen, I've had, so I've, had, I've been lucky to have the record uh, with me now for a couple of weeks, and it's fantastic. You guys sound as fresh as ever, and I think it's going to be really successful. Thanks so much for the positive words, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to hook up here in the States and be able to see us, you know? Awesome, buddy. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks to David for the interview. We're going to close with a track off of the new album, Toto 14. This is a track called Holy War. 
For upcoming news and interviews, please check theparkreport.com. And don't forget to check us out on Facebook and Twitter and download our podcast on iTunes. Thanks. Thanks.